Hey folks, this is Riker with a gaming news wrap-up video where we discuss the happenings of the week. This week's topics include Blizzard's response to the rumor that Diablo 4 is coming to Game Pass, the Microsoft acquisition of Activision Blizzard being all but secured, Baldur's Gate 3 becoming the best D&D sim ever, and more. As always, discussion timestamps can be found in the description below. But right before you skip ahead, just a quick reminder to ring that sub notification bell to be alerted to new Saturday episodes and stay up to date with gaming news highlights. Now, as you folks know, my guilty pleasure over the years has been Hero Collector games. We played a few of them with you guys, even had a Rikers Raiders clan and everything. Well, the latest one I've been checking out is Watcher of Realms, a next-gen fantasy RPG and today's sponsor. Visually, the game looks great. Having good-looking heroes is always a key to these games. The high-quality audiovisual effects help immerse you into the world and make you care about the characters that you're chasing after. There's over 100 unique heroes from over 30 races to collect and upgrade, and faction synergies are a big factor when picking the lineup you want to send into battle. You run your heroes through missions and find loot to power up your team, all through a rich story campaign across a grand fantasy world that ties the missions together, and every hero has its own lore write-up. The game is really user-friendly, but offers deep strategic gameplay and picking your roster of heroes to get the best combinations and how to time your hero abilities in combat. You could use auto fight and auto enhance for easier time management, but when things get real, like if you decide to join in PvP to try to climb the leaderboards, or you're fighting a tough boss, you want to be actively playing. You can team up with guild partners to challenge the epic dragon and rush to the top of the guild rankings. And if the guild dragon battle isn't enough, then check out the tide mode where you'll face off against countless monsters and bosses. And the RPG elements are professionally diverse for the genre. Of course, you farm resources and gear to power up your heroes by running dungeons, but then unlike other games, every hero is worth upgrading. Collecting heroes from the same faction increases their effectiveness and different factions have different strengths, so you may want to send different heroes on different missions. Now, something really exciting, to celebrate the launch of the game, there's going to be a competition event between two teams, the Game Theorists versus J. Schlatt Live. You folks can pick a team to support, and you'll have the chance to win a bunch of prizes, including in-game rewards, as well as iPhones, a Nintendo Switch, or an Xbox. So definitely check the link in the description for the full details on this event, and download Watcher of Realms for free by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code on screen. Kicking things off with Diablo news. Last week, we spoke about the Lilith statue you, that hardcore race competition ladder statue, whereby the names of the first thousand people to reach hardcore level 100 and properly submit their information will have their names chiseled into the statue. And we reported last week that allegedly some people fit the criteria, but their names did not appear on the list for verification. Well, the official Diablo Twitter responded to the claims, promising to look into things. Quote, The Blessed Mother loves her hardcore children. Hell's forces are reviewing some of the forgotten souls whose achievements slip through the cracks due to entry errors, but still deserve celebrating. We will share an amended list with these additional heroes in the near future. So they're basically confirming that people done goofed, they didn't properly follow the procedures, and that's why their name was not in the list of names, but they're going to make exceptions for some people. Now, one question is, does that mean they're going to have a thousand plus names or are some people at the bottom of that list going to get bumped off? I certainly hope that people aren't going to get bumped off. If they saw their name on that list, they they should be on the statue, meaning and, and I do believe that what Blizzard will end up doing is just add some extra names. You know, who's going to actually go and count to ensure it's precisely a thousand anyway? Oh, you know people are going to do it. In other news, there's an absolutely broken, bonkers, shred druid build that has been <laughs> making the headlines. It deals billions of damage through uh, an overpowered combination of double dipping on damage modifiers. Blizzard says that they're looking into it and they are going to be fixing this. This is not intended behavior. I believe it was Moxie who first put out a video showcasing this broken combination. This story ended up getting picked up by PC Gamer. PC Gamer reached out to Blizzard and a Blizzard rep told them, quote, This behavior is unintentional. The team is looking at changing it in the near future in order to improve the balance. And if I had to guess, they're probably racing to get this adjusted before Season 1 launches next Thursday. Now, speaking of Season 1, we actually got the sizzle trailer for the Season of the Malignant. Would have been nice to have this ready in time for the presentation for the live stream the previous week, but it promises a new boss battle with the tiniest glimpse of what that boss looks like. We also got a tiny bit more information on the malignant heart types. Again, there are four malignant heart types. These are effectively gems that go in jewelry sockets 
In season one, every jewelry socket will have a color, and you gotta match the same color heart with the same color socket. The only exception is the Wrathful Heart on the right. This is a white item that can go in any color socket. Otherwise, it looks like red hearts are offensive, blue hearts are defensive, and pink hearts are utility powers. As for white hearts, they're just super power. Again, they said that these are designed in such a way that you won't want to only have these Wrathful Hearts, but it sounds like every build will want one or two. For more information on Season 1, you can check out my breakdown video over here, or if you're looking at what can you do to prepare for Season 1, because there's stuff that you can do before Season 1 starts to ensure you have the most efficient season start that you can possibly have, you can check out this video here. Now, in an interview with Forbes, we also got reconfirmation that in order to complete the Battle Pass, you do not need to reach level 100 in-game. Months ago, Blizzard had said, I think, that it's going to take about 80 hours to complete the battle pass. This is over the course of a three month season. And they had also said that reaching level 100 should take more time than that. Also this week, a story that's making the headlines is that over 9,000 people contributed to Diablo 4. I believe it was Twisted Voxel that first reported on this, and this is based on Moby Games data. Now Moby Games, this is this website that's a repository of game credits, basically to Put it plainly. So according to Moby Games, 9,166 people were credited in the development of Diablo 4. And if you watch through the credits, that's the number you believe. Those are some very long credits. Now, Twisted Voxel gave the breakdown that 2,464 of these people were working on the game's sound design and providing voiceovers. A total of 26 people were credited for creature voice effects. So this 9,000 figure, this isn't 9,000 developers. This is anyone who helped contribute in any way, even to give like one line for one NPC, your name is in the credits. 902 people had art slash graphics related roles. 397 were involved with quality assurance. I'm actually surprised. I imagine that number would have been higher. 394 had programming slash engineering related roles. And another 193 were involved with the game's design. 475 people were thanked for their contribution to the game's development. Basically in the special thanks section. While this doesn't give you a sense of scope of the size of the team working on Diablo 4, it does give an idea of how many people were involved in some way in the production over the many, many years. Because another thing to consider is, even if you have, let's say, for argument's sake, 300 developers, there's turnover. So yeah, you have 300 developers over the course of so many years, so you might end up crediting like 600 people if you account for turnover. Now, as we're approaching Season 1, a lot of people have been wondering, are we going to have a Rebirth option? Diablo 3 players know that Rebirth was a feature added to the game some years ago. It was a very uh, appreciated feature. When you only have so many character slots, eventually you max out your character slots, and then if you need to make a new character in Season, that means you have to delete an existing character. And in Diablo 3, when Seasons were around, well, you know, you could have had hundreds and thousands of hours on a character, and it's it just feels bad, man, to delete that character and lose all that that history. Especially because Diablo 3 would give you stats. It would track, you know, this character, you have, you know, 238 hours played on this character. So if you delete the character and remake it, that goes back to zero. Whereas if you rebirth the character, rebirthing is effectively converting a character into a seasonal character. So it resets them to level one, but it's still the same character. It's still the same customized appearance, the same name, and the same hours logged. All your gear gets mailed to your non-season account, but your character then becomes a fresh level one seasonal character. Is it the end of the world to not have this feature? It's not the end of the world, but it's, it's an, an, again, an appreciated feature. And community lead Adam Fletcher stated on Twitter that... Rebirth is not yet a feature in Diablo 4, but the team is aware that this is a very requested feature. So hopefully by the time most people are maxing out their character slots, we'll get rebirthing. Now the last bit of Diablo news we're going to cover here comes via an alleged leak that was reposted by Game Pass Tracker. They said there's a Brazilian payment app called PicPay that recently said Diablo 4 is available on Game Pass. This image here allegedly says, available now, get it now, or play it through Xbox Game Pass. And this banner was removed shortly after being posted. Seeing the tweet, Blizzard President Mikey Barra posted a reply stating, this is not happening. 
And I just love how frank and matter of fact that was. Just no three sentences of PR speak. No, no ambiguous, this is something that we're entertaining, yada yada. It just does not, this isn't happening. Just no. Just no. Instantly killing the rumor. And of course, this rumor emerged because the acquisition of Activision Blizzard by Microsoft was really heating up at the time. And yes, in a future where Microsoft owns Blizzard, which we'll talk about in a moment, but it is very much where we are headed now. In such a world, it is conceivable that eventually Diablo 4 makes it to Game Pass. But now, not a chance. <laughs> this game just released. You're going to give it away for free on Game Pass when you don't need to be doing that yet. You're going to potentially lose a bunch of sales because some people are just going to play through the campaign in their month of having it on Game Pass. They're going to love the game. They're going to complete it and they're going to move on. No chance those sales are just being thrown away. Maybe in a year. Minimum. Now, speaking of Microsoft acquiring Activision Blizzard, the big court case, FTC versus Microsoft. That happened last week, and we were waiting for the judge's ruling. Did the FTC convince the judge to stop the acquisition? No. Quote, The court finds the FTC has not shown a likelihood it will prevail on its claim this particular vertical merger in this specific industry may substantially lessen competition. To the contrary, the record evidence points to more consumer access to Call of Duty and other Activision content. Now, this is not a surprising outcome if you've been following the trial. The FTC did a very poor job of supporting their arguments. Uh, they just even picked the wrong arguments to put forth. It honestly felt more like they were defending Sony than they were defending consumers, which is literally their job. I mean, the judge literally had to remind the FTC that they're arguing in favor of consumers and not in favor of Sony. So following the ruling, Mike Ibarra posted on Twitter, quote, what a great way to start a Tuesday. Ibarra worked for Microsoft for almost two decades before joining Blizzard in 2019, and he became president in 2021. He further tweeted, quote, we have so much coming from such talented teams. Some people told me years ago Blizzard was a sleeping giant. To them, I say, the sleeping giant is awake and in full force. Players are the center of everything we do and always will be. We're just getting started. Now, the FTC had the right to appeal the judge's decision, and they did so pretty much immediately. So that means the case would then go to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So the previous ruling happened under district court. Now they're taking it to federal court, basically pulling a, an ultimate, I want to talk to the manager moment. And with surprising alacrity, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals denied the FTC. So what this means is that the only thing that was stopping now the deal from going through was the temporary restraining order the district judge put after ruling against the FTC. Just put a temporary restraining order just so that Blizzard and uh, Microsoft and Activision couldn't close this deal right away. The judge wanted to give the FTC time to appeal the decision, and that temporary restraining order ended at midnight last night, Friday night. So, with the federal court, before that deadline expired, with them denying the FTC again, that means, as of now, it is possible for Microsoft to go through with the acquisition, and who knows, by the time of the posting of this video, maybe it has already gone through. That said, it is likely for it to be slightly delayed, at least into early next week. The final deadline is the 18th. This was the deadline set a very long time in the past, where if the deadline is not reached, if the deal does not go through by the 18th of July, then Microsoft has to pay Activision Blizzard $3 billion. Though both parties could agree to an extension. But... As of right now, the only roadblock still in the way is the UK's regulator, the CMA. They had already ruled against the merger. However, after seeing what happened with the FTC, it seems the CMA is open to renegotiating. They've extended the deadline for their final decision to now be August 29th. Originally, they were going to be giving their final decision next week. They had blocked the deal in principle, but they hadn't formally actually finally done it. They were waiting for July 18th to do that. Now they're pushing back that date to the 29th, and that's because they want to talk with Microsoft once again. And this is apparently because Microsoft has submitted to them a new 
complex and detailed proposal that they need time to go over. So the reason for this extension is they need these six weeks to reevaluate whether this new proposal is acceptable. Microsoft hasn't appealed the CMA's decision because they wanted to submit this new proposal before they formally appeal. And what experts are saying is that the CMA isn't going to be interested in any kind of promises about behavior, about, oh, we're going to, you know, make this 10 years of non-exclusivity. They're not interested in that. What they're interested in is breaking up the business somehow. And according to Bloomberg, the proposal is that the specific part that the CMA actually anchored upon and denied the entire deal of going through on revolved around cloud gaming. So Bloomberg is saying that Microsoft is proposing that in the UK, they're going to break off their cloud gaming division and give that off to a different company. That said, it's possible for Microsoft to close the deal even before the CMA agrees. The worst case scenario is that Microsoft can't do business in the UK. And while that won't make Microsoft happy, because that's a huge market share, it's not going to make a lot of UK people happy either, so this is going to be a lot of added pressure on the CMA to acquiesce. Honest and Baldur's Gate 3 news. With the game's October 3rd release coming up, we've been getting some new information emerge about the game via some journalistic outlet previews. From Games Radar's preview, we learn that Baldur's Gate 3 is allegedly the closest we've ever come to a full simulation of Dungeons & Dragons. Basically, anyone who's played D&D can tell you some story. Everyone is eager to tell you some story about some chaotic, unfolding series of events that probably started from some plan that went haywire. And this is the kind of thing that's just very difficult to replicate in a video game setting. Lead writer Adam Smith said, quote, What we realized very quickly is that people will get everywhere in the setting. And then we need to put invisible walls up and we need to take away flight. But we weren't going to do that. Games Radar reports that while talking to the devs, the devs were talking about how, okay, we're building up this scenario and, you know, our players are going to be here in this part of the city. But, oh, what happens if they use the fly spell and go up on the roof and now they can see what's behind those buildings. Now we have to design what's behind those buildings. Uh, you know what, it's just a lot easier to either, re let's remove fly the flight ability from the game, or let's put up invisible walls here to block our players in. And they just decided, nah, we're not gonna do that. We're not gonna put up these invisible barriers and invisible constraints. We're gonna be like D&D, we're gonna let the player do what the player wants to do. We're not going to build the game world in such a way that it confines you. And that means that they realized, oh, we're not just building an RPG. We're now building a simulator. Something like Thief or Deus Ex or Dishonored, where they have to build up this entire living, breathing setting with NPCs that are going to react to the different things that your characters are going to do in different and, and unusual ways. You need the game world to be alive so that when you make these unconventional decisions, it can react appropriately. And another way in which Baldur's Gate 3 is kind of like Dungeons and Dragons is that they added a difficulty that is basically like a dungeon master really pushing you to your limits. At least that's how the devs described it on a panel. The highest difficulty is called Tactician, and it doesn't just buff enemy stats and make their AI more aggressive. In Tactician difficulty, the devs actually go through every individual fight and find some unique way of increasing that specific fight's challenge. Senior combat designer Matt Holland said, we want to make it feel like you're going up against a DM that's trying to push you to your limits. And Lyran creative director Sven Vink added, quote, You're going to start playing on Tactician because you can handle it. Then you're going to start crying. Now we know Baldur's Gate 3 is releasing first on PC and then later on PlayStation. We have a confirmed date for that release. We know it's also being worked on for Xbox, but we don't have an Xbox release date. And it seems one of the reasons for that is split screen. The devs say that split screen is a must have feature, but apparently the Xbox Series S is struggling to render split screen at acceptable performance rates. And Microsoft demands feature parity between the Xbox Series S and the Xbox Series X. So they can't just say, well, split screen is only available on the Xbox Series X, but they also don't want to compromise Baldur's Gate 3 by removing split screen altogether. So they're at a point where they're just continuing to work through the problem and hopefully it won't take too much longer to get past that hurdle. 
Then around up the news really quick in some Path of Exile news. We found out that PoE will have a presence at PAX West. We already knew the team would be at Gamescom, which takes place in Cologne, Germany from August 23rd through 27th. Path of Exile 2 will be playable at their booth, but now we also learned the game will be playable at PAX West. That's in Seattle from September 1st through 5th. And lastly, we learned that Last Epoch will also be at Gamescom. And I can now reveal that I too will be at Gamescom representing Last Epoch. I'll be at the Last Epoch booth, so do come by, say hi, check out the game, talk to the devs, pick their minds, because I've been talking about this game for years, and I've been saying they do some stuff that I just really love. They, to this day, still have my favorite active skill system of any ARPG ever. I'm honestly surprised, because this game's been in alpha for a while, this has been out there. I'm honestly surprised. It boggles my mind that no one has stolen this from them yet. They also came up with a genius solution to the trading problem that is a big point of debate in the genre. Anyway, all this to say, it's a game that I think is going to be a really valuable addition to the ARPG genre. They're a really solid team, they're doing great work, and hopefully we're marching forward towards a final official release date announcement. And that's going to wrap up this week's video. But do be sure to check out last week's video in which we discussed how Diablo 4 was causing nightmares and children and... 40-year-old adults as well. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch Patreon and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.